Hello everyone, Simon Jacobson here, and this is the beginning of a new series, a popular demand, called Biblical Characters Decoded. Biblical Characters Decoded. Lessons for Life. And this week we're going to cover Adam and Eve, the very first couple. Lessons on relationships, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the divine. This program is dedicated by Irina Kamisarenko for Rafu Schlemer for, Ve- for Velvo Wolf Zev Ben Lea. Okay. So who doesn't know the story of Adam and Eve? And in it, fascinatingly, is contained everything we need to know about relationships. That's one of the powerful things of the Bible that <clears throat> in an amazing way in just succinct, short sentences and few verses, you get the whole story. The good, the bad, the ugly, the divine, the pros, the cons, the ups and downs. Obviously, they need to be fleshed out, the nuances. So let's begin. On one hand, to use a modern cliche, you can't live without him, you can't live without her. On the other hand, you can't live with him, you can't live with her. This is a common phrase that people say today about relationships. I personally don't like the phrase, but it captures the complexity and the paradox of relationships that on one hand, can you exist? Can you really live? Can you thrive without love, without a relationship, without another? We all know it's necessary from the moment we're born and even earlier, that the concept of attachment, of connection, the nurturing and everything that comes with love. There are many different theories on why we love each other and why we need it, but there's no doubt that we need it. A flower needs water, a human being needs love. Now we talk about love, not just parental love, but the love of an equal, the love of another. In this case, we're talking about a couple. We're talking about relationships. So on the other hand, we see how complicated it can get. Two people, especially strangers, two different genders, Different backgrounds, different families, have different perspectives, have different approaches, have different personalities. So it's one thing when you have a business relationship which is limited, conditional. There are elements of it where you are engaged. There are elements where there are boundaries. But when you're 24-7 with another person under the same roof, in a full commitment, doesn't it seem inevitable that there are going to be conflicts to the point that sometimes conflicts that are not reconcilable? and hence the high rate of divorce, physical divorce, meaning legal divorce, and how many people are divorced emotionally, even though they're together for whatever reason, either because of the known evil is better than the unknown evil for their children, for convenience, just the inertia of a relationship, difficult to get out of your your, um, status quo. So how do we find this balance? And then, of course, so we find there's the good side of a relationship. I've just explained it. Nurturing, the companionship, the intimacy, the validation. There's the bad side where we have conflicts and so on. There's the ugly side where you see two people can claim they're completely in love, infatuated with each other, inseparable, and a few years later, they're in a divorce court, hate each other, the ugliest type of battle. It would never have been imagined. But there's the fourth thing called the divine. And all these four you'll find in the story of Adam and Eve. And in it lies also the secret of to find the proper balance. So first, let's make this clear. There's no magic pill. You know, if there was, then we wouldn't keep having best-selling books that tell us the five secrets of relationships, of enduring relationships, of love, of marriage. Because if there was a book that did it, why are there another bestseller? It's because clearly nobody has mastered this formula. Suggestions have been made, ideas have been made, but I would submit that something that goes back to the Bible talking about thousands of years ago that has also produced people and families that are enduring till today that there must be some formula here, which takes into account all the factors that I mentioned and yet is able to understand both the comedy and the tragedy sometimes that relationships can lead to, but also the key to an enduring, lasting, and I would even say an eternal relationship. So here you have Adam and Eve. Firstly, 
it tells us in just a few verses the very secret of love. There are many theories about love. One of the most prevalent ones, I'll call a Darwinian Freudian model or a scientific model. I can't say it's the only one, but one is that it's about survival of the fittest. It's about survival. The most of the cardinal rule in, his, in, na- in nature, in existence, and therefore in history, is the species must survive, most important thing. And as such, the way to breed, to pr- produce the next generation, the offspring of a species, you need them to breed. Why would they come together? So nature, in its own mysterious way, developed a thing called attraction, sexual attraction, physical attraction, different levels of attraction, brings together male and female, they breed, conceive, and produce the next generation. And every species has exactly the same thing, that necess- necessity. The question is, however, the concept of romance and courtship, there are even there are thinkers like Schopenhauer and others who say the whole concept of romantic love is just a delusion, a trick evolution plays on the human being because mu- humans have mutated Beyond the norm. Look at animals. They don't need the whole elaborate courting. They don't need to go on a date and let's go to a bar, let's get a drink, let's go to a museum, let's date, let's, let's get to know each other. They understand the efficiency of, of, yes, there are certain schemes that you'll see peacocks or elephants or birds or any other species to attract the, the, the other gender, demonstrating either their strength or their, their vitality or their uh, virility, their ability to produce healthy offspring. And all that's been written about in the evolutionary biological texts on this topic. But essentially it comes down to very one raw, simple fact. We need to get them together, and so on. So like Schopenhauer would say, the love, the concept of love, is simply as a result of human beings becoming too smart for their own good. So instead of just breeding, they have to go into whole elaborate schemes, and so on. So okay, makes them feel better, fine, so be it. The biblical Adam and Eve version, however, is very, very different that the male and female were part of one androgynous whole, one entity. And that entity was created in the divine image. It's a transcendent spiritual essential experience of oneness and unity. Then they were split into two, and that's why they're attracted to each other. Having children and offspring is a second they're blessed with. You'll come together, I will bless you with the ability to be fruitful and multiply and expand all over the world. But the key is the reunion, the reunion of two halves of one soul. And hence we have the concept of a soulmate. It's a very different concept, a very different idea. It's driven by transcendence, not by survival. Do you see the difference between survival and transcendence? If love is driven by survival, then it's very much about an efficient negotiation. And you know what? If you're not helping me my survival... It's, easily for, it's easy for me to drop you. Whereas when it's transcendence, so then it's something greater than the sum of the parts. It's not just about me, not just about you. We're both connected to something greater and deeper that's greater than both of us. And hence the concept of an eternal relationship. We're both ready to commit to something greater than me. It's not just about my needs and your needs. It doesn't mean it doesn't have needs. But it's not begin doesn't begin and end with needs. It begins and ends with transcendence and something spiritual. So in addition to the three levels of compatibility so f- everyone's familiar with, physical sexual compatibility, emotional compatibility, intellectual compatibility, compatibilities that all of them shift and can change in lifetime. You know, sometimes a person gets older, they're not as physically attractive. And the same thing with emotional, you get bored. You look for other emotional stimulation. And the same thing with intellectual compatibility, all subject to change, like everything in this world. Everything in this world changes. Everything is temporary. Everything erodes, deteriorates, and dies. Except one thing, when you're committed to something greater than you are. And that comes the fourth level of compatibility, which is the essential story of Adam and Eve, that they're both part of a divine image, a transcendent Reality and transcendence cannot be, does not deteriorate and does not erode and doesn't die. Why? Because it's about a cause greater than yourself. It's not mortal. It's not subject to the laws of mortality. And that's why you hear that love never dies, that people, 
even though physically they may not continue to live on, but their legacy, their spiritual connection, the mark they made in the universe, the vision they share, can go on for generations and really never end. And that is the key. And that's what the biblical story of Adam and Eve, in essence, is all about. But it's not so simple. Because we, did live in, we do live in a world of survival. We do live in a world of materialism. We do live in a world of selfishness and self-interest. And it always comes into play in relationships. You'll never or hardly ever find a relationship that's purely transcendent, that each individual doesn't have any personal interest. Besides the fact that we, by nature, are wired to be subjective, we also are affected by other influences. Our parents, our environment, society, our childhood. Traumas, fears, insecurities. If you grew up in a very nurturing home, you were validated and have that in deeper, in deeper security. But there are many of us that are, don't feel that way. So we grow into adults fearful. We don't always express, express it, but it comes out in relationships. And when you're fearful and, you, and you've not been validated enough and you've not been nurtured, then what happens in a relationship? You're looking for that. Sometimes we look to the other for our own identity because we've never developed our own identity. So in the healthiest model, you'd have the model of Adam and Eve. Each of us is an Adam and an Eve, each of us with an intact soul, with a good sense of self, at the same time a good sense of boundaries. That's the perfect scenario. But there is no perfect scenario in this world. So now we have to contend with all the other factors that I just mentioned. And that's where life becomes complicated. That's where a relationship tends to lean over. It's not just the beautiful and the good and the divine. You also have the negative and even the ugly. So, But you need to understand, and that's what the Bible also addresses, that that is exactly what happens to Adam and Eve. Even though they do are born and created in the divine image and have that element of connection, what happens next? Of course, the famous story, the story of the tree of knowledge. And what is the story, essentially? That they were told by God by their transcendent connection of their, their soulmates in the divine image, the divine image shares with them that this, you shall eat from every tree, but not this tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't bring evil into your life. Yes, you can know about it philosophically, but don't taste of it. Don't experience it. Remain pure, remain innocent. And that's why Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. Like a newborn child. Yes, they were 20 years old, not newborns. But their consciousness was one of innocence, of seamlessness. Seamlessness, transparent seamlessness. Why is a child not embarrassed of, their, of its nakedness or nudity? It's not because the child is stupid or naive, because there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's part of who you are. You have eyes, you have ears, you have arms, you have legs, you have a mind, you have a heart, and you have sexuality. You have organs that perhaps are not used, obviously, by a young child but you have parts of who you are that will help you later when the time comes right, when you find your soulmate and you can bond and connect and become one flesh and, bring, and bear offspring. That's what it is. So in that sense, why should there be any self-consciousness? But then Adam and Eve in their curiosity are tempted. The serpent is the force of temptation that says, why don't you try it? Since you know the concept, why don't you taste from it? And what happens is they lose their innocence. And now they're suddenly aware of a self, I'm self-conscious of my own entity, of my own reality. Dissonance has entered into existence. So you have the pure innocence and then the loss of innocence. Do we, any of us remember when we lost our innocence? You can't really pinpoint. You just can know there was a time like paradise lost. Rosebud of the classic Citizen Kane the pure, innocent time when we lived as children, everything was seemingly pure. And I'm talking about if you're in a healthy environment. But then comes the first birth of dissonance, loss of innocence. And dissonance easily evolves ultimately into duplicity, into divisiveness, into all other forms of fragmentation. And especially if, unfortunately, we grow up in a home where there is more fragmentation than need be, conflicts between parents, judgmentalism, criticism, addictions, alcoholism, and other forms of abuse, whether it's overt or subtle, bottom line is it all impacts the impressionable, innocent, defenseless child. And now that pure 
an innocent relationship that Adam and Eve had now has entered a new stage. So actually the story of an Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve is our own story, every one of us. The, pre, pre, the innocent stage, the age of innocence, and then the post when we're no longer that innocent. And once we lose that, we don't lose it forever, as we'll soon discuss, that's where the problems begin. So now you're looking to our relationship, not just for your transcendent soulmate, for experiencing a higher state of unity, the search for global unity, for personal unity. Even the scientific search for a theory of everything, that singularity, to find the unity, the the complete unity theory, also in our personal lives. But now we have to contend with fear, with insecurity, with inhibitions, with judgmentalism. Does he really, does she really love me? Why do I feel so paranoid? We deal with betrayal, with fears of betrayal. I mean, the list goes on. You can fill in the blanks. But this is, so we have the pre-tree of knowledge and the post-tree of knowledge in our own personal lives. And you see how the biblical story comes alive. And as the serpent, the forces of temptation, doesn't have to be necessarily a physical serpent in our own personal lives. It's whatever tempts us, whatever distracts us. And we may think it's very simple. You know, big thing, so I, I eat from the tree of knowledge. So I try something that's forbidden. Or I do something that is inconsistent with my real essence. But then you are a different person. You've changed. So you see what happens next is Adam and Eve, both of them, in a way, turn on each other. They become, they start blaming each other. To the point that Eve says to Adam, you know, what did you do to me? And Adam says, what do you mean? You tempted me. And Eve says, well, you didn't exactly give me the right instructions. And back and forth and back and forth. And there's the cause and effect of what happens next. What does dissonance create? A uh, disconnect. A disconnect in the relationship. A disconnect from yourself. When God says to Adam, Ayeko, where are you in the Garden of Eden? What do you mean? He knows where he is. But Ayeko is the ultimate statement of dissonance. You could be sitting near someone and you say, where are you? Not you, I, I know where you are physically. Where's your mind? Where's your heart? I don't see you. I don't recognize you. You're aligned with me. You're aligned with your purpose. There becomes the division between who you are and what you do. The essence of your being and how you express yourself. A split, a schism between survival and transcendence. And it affects Adam in the way that now, now you will have to go out and earn your, your keep through the sweat of your brow. Through the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread. You'll have to toil and work. Till then, when you're aligned with your purpose, I will take care of your physical needs. You just have to make sure that your spirituality, your values, are, you're, you're busy with them, and that's what you're living up to. I'll take care of your physical needs. The same thing with Eve. Don't worry about a thing. You'll bear offspring without pain. It'll be seamless. The, all the pain bearing, the, all the, child, the pains of child carrying and childbearing are, won't exist. But now that you've separated yourself from your higher purpose, you're not just living a transcendent life, you're living a life with your own agenda, so now you're going to have to deal with working hard and having to go out of your own natural self to go find a job. And the same thing, a pain. Why should children cause pain? Children are the most greatest blessing. It should just come seamless because you've disconnected. There's a dissonance. However, not all is lost. Even though they are expelled from paradise because they no, longer, they no longer are that seamless, innocent reality that they were before all of this happened, but not all is lost. The story begins. Now, in this struggling life, in this life of dissonance, in this life, in this life of fragmentation and disjointedness, you have the ability to reconnect because you're still two souls of one part. You still have that divine image within you. Because the, the concept is that, this, that sin does not create a, 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 a total loss and destruction of our who we essentially are. It's just gone undercover. In the words of Michelangelo, when he was asked, how do you sculpt those beautiful angels in the marble? And he said, I see the angels trapped in the marble. And I carved and carved and set them free. So the angel remains an angel. Your divine image remains your divine image right now. You and I. However, it can go undercover. It can be trapped in marble. It can be trapped in concrete. It can be trapped in other substances. It can be trapped in our, through our own fears and inhibitions and insecurities. 
and all the other phobias and neurosis that we go to therapy for, trying to find our true selves. But the true self is there. So how do you reclaim, regain it? By looking at your life in a different way. That's the story of Adam and Eve. By looking at your life, that the divine innocence that you are always remains intact. It's just you've wandered off. Now, it's not just a just, it takes work. But the problem is, the problem sometimes becomes our reality. They call confirmation bias. You start confirming the biases of your life, the prejudices. You start thinking that you are not who, who that essential divine transcendent creature, the divine image. I'm someone else. Like when you ask someone, who are you? They give you their business card. And I say to them, That's, that, your business card tells me what you do, not who you are. Some sigh and say, you know what? I have become. Who I am has become what I do. That means we start defining our reality based on the present. That's not correct. That's why we have the biblical story of Adam and Eve. You're truly the Adam and Eve pre-tree of knowledge. You need to access it. How do you do that? By con- reconnecting to your soul. Don't see yourself as a material be- human being, perhaps on a spiritual journey. You're a spiritual being, a soul, on a material journey, on a physical journey. And you do that by reinforcing your own spirituality through immersing it in a spiritual spa. Study, prayer, action, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral conditioning to start seeing yourself as a soulful entity, a transcendent entity entering into a world of survival. Not a survival creature who once in a while experiences transcendence for whatever reason. You're a transcendent creature in order to, with the purpose of bringing transcendence into a materialistic and selfish and hostile universe. And you do that through your own cognizance, your own awareness. So then you reframe your life. Don't look at your life as a product of your problems, that you're a victim, that you've defined by your troubles. You're not defined by your, by your suffering. You're not tra- defined by your traumas. You're not defined by your, your difficulties of life. You're defined by your soul. So that reframes it all, and that opens you up to be able to have a true, healthy relationship. You go on a date and speak about this at some point. I say at some point, just because not everybody is ready for it immediately. And you'll be surprised. L- allow your soul to communicate in your dating process in your relationship, in your courtship, and ultimately in the marriage. And encourage your partner to do the same. That's the key when we talk about a complete and true relationship. Are there going to be times of conflict and difficulties and challenges? Of course. But you have what to work with. Because you're not defined by the difficulties. You're defined by the soulfulness. And then the soulfulness is going to have to contend with the challenges of this material world, where there will be difference of opinions, There'll be conflicts, there'll be fears, there'll be uh, paranoia, there'll be all the different things that come in a life, especially if there was a betrayal, if there was hurt, especially past hurt. Not so easy to get over disappointments. But when you know and you understand that you are essentially a spiritual creature in a material world, it changes the whole picture. This, my friends, is in brief, the story of Adam and Eve. In a nutshell, in a nutshell, the whole story, the most beautiful how it descends into a reality that can be sometimes not so beautiful, even bad or ugly, but because of the divine element has the ability to transcend even that. And then you know what? You come out even stronger. Because it's one thing when a naive or innocent person has a relationship, fine. But if you've tasted the other side, you've tasted the forbidden fruit, you've lost innocence, and then you reclaim and regain it, you reclaim a paradise that may have been lost for a while, and you reconcile. You have a power now that is indestructible. The power that comes from experiencing the negative and that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So that your relationship can thrive and yes, be eternal. An eternal bond and create eternal values and legacy. Create children that will create further children ad infinitum. A taste of infinity, of eternity in this mortal and finite life. Thank you so much, and please join me again Sunday. We're doing this Sunday live, meaningful live, this new series, Biblical Characters Decoded, Lessons for Life. This has been Simon Jacobson at Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com. Check us out for a robust schedule of activities to different audiences and different topics. Please share, like, comment, 
suggestions, all is welcome. Thank you so much.